go ahead and open up our Bibles. Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter 13. Continuing in our Romans series. Uh, we don't have very many chapters really to go. And so I'll be seeking the Lord in prayer about what to bring during Sunday school when we do finish Romans. And we've come to a chapter... Now, again, starting at chapter 12, we start seeing doctrinal or practical exhortations. In chapter 12, we, we saw that as Christians, how are we to live this life? Well, we, are to be, we, we, are, we have responsibilities to be devoted to God. In chapter 12, that's what it starts off with. We're devoted to God. Then it says that we are devoted to one another. And then it it tells us as Christians that we are to love one another and to love your enemies, to love the others. And then um, right here in chapter 13, now he talks about our responsibility to government. It's a very interesting placement here that he puts it in. and, And as the Christian citizen in chapter 13, verse 1, Here's what he says. He says, Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Chapter 13 is not that long. We're going to look at three main subjects. Um, The subjects are the Christian citizen, the Christian debt, and the Christian incentive. So the first thing we see are the governments are of God. And read in verse 2. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. Now, in verse 1, he says, let every soul be subject. And that word subject is putting yourself in a subordinate position unto the higher powers. That word power is is excusia. It means authority. Now, in our King James Version, they translate authority and they translate power, both as power. So sometimes when you're reading the Word of God and you see that it was, uh, to them he gave power to be the sons of God, well, that word power is excusia. It's authority. And then uh, Jesus says all Power is given unto me, therefore go. When he's given the Great Commission, that word power is excusia. It means authority. But in other places, it does talk about the power, the dynamic power of God and dunamis, where we get the word dynamite. So it's important here in chapter 13, especially when he's talking about the Christian's role to, its, to their government. And it looks like the, the Weimers are here this morning. Uh, let every soul be subject unto the higher authorities. So if we can take this word powers and say authorities, for there is no authority but of God. The authorities, plural, that exist, they only exist because they're ordained of God. And that's what it says in verse 1. Paul exhorts Titus to do this very same thing. In Titus 3.1, he, he exhorts Titus to put them in mind to be subject to principalities, the things assigned to leadership, and powers, authorities, to obey magistrates, those that are assigned as leaders within the authority, and to be ready to every good work, to speak evil of no man, to be brawlers, but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. So in Romans chapter 13, And then when he's talking about this, how to be a Christian citizen, he also charged Titus to charge the congregation with this same thing. When he's talking about principalities and powers, he's not talking about the spiritual uh, kingdom. You know, in Ephesians, it talks about how God, uh, how Jesus has defeated the principalities and the powers of the air. This is literally talking about the principalities and the powers that are physical as we sojourn on this earth as God's people. In 1 Peter chapter 2, if you want to flip over there, 1 Peter chapter 2, 
And you may want to put a pin in 1 Peter. That's going to be where we uh, are going to have our 11 o'clock message. Well, if I can get there myself. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 13. This is the exhortation. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 13, he says, Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme or unto governors as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. For so is the will of God that with well-doing ye may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. So the exhortation is consistent throughout how we as God's people are to conduct ourselves when it comes to government. Jesus and the apostles all did this. They were submissive to the authorities which God had ordained to be over you on earth. Uh, Really it comes down to this is no honest Christian is a troublemaker for the government. No honest Christian is a troublemaker for authorities. Uh, the Christian, you've, you've heard me say this many times, the Christian should be the best citizen any government has. Now, and here's the thing. We know that there is evil that exists in government. We know that there are evil people that exist in government. Us being submissive to government and to authorities is not us condoning their behavior. Being submissive to the authorities is being submissive to God who has ordained the authority to be there. Uh, as God's people, we are not anti-government. But we are mindful of what God has ordained. We're, we're pro-God. <laughs> we're not anti-government. We're pro-God's ordination of authorities that exist upon the earth. Now, there's two reasons that he tells us in verse 1 of chapter 13 to be subject unto the higher authorities. Number one, for there is no authority but of God. Any authority that we have on earth is from God. That if a person who has authority must submit to authority. Because the ultimate authority is in God. All the authorities work their way back up into the final authority. And God is the final authority. And he says the powers, the authorities that be, that exist, are ordained of God. And so this also does not mean here that there is a conflict with what we read in Revelation chapter 13. Revelation chapter 13 focuses on the dragon, Satan, and how he has and how he is and how he is going to manipulate world government and false religion to oppress, to speak blasphemies against God and to oppress God's people. And so we need to understand that this is not in conflict. Although God has ordained all the earthly principalities, all the earthly authorities to be, it's not in conflict with what we see in Revelation chapter 13. How Satan has used false religion and government. And those two usually go hand in hand. Because uh, look through the trail of blood. What has it been that has persecuted the Christians? Church and state. When church and state, when false religion and government married and started creating laws according to religion, that's when God's people would suffer the most persecution. So in Revelation chapter 13, where he's talking about that old serpent, this, uh, Satan, the dragon, and these two beasts, talking about government and talking about false religion, has, has reared up, and God has allowed it. Here's the thing we need to understand about Revelation is it is an encouragement to God's people in the church. Revelation was written to the Lord's people in the churches. And he wrote it to be a comfort. Yes, God may be allowing these things to happen. I mean, government could be falling apart. They're ordering, just think of all the martyrs that who, under the bloodshed of the government and, and everything. And, and the revelation is comforting the saints, saying, 
God may be permitting these things, but take comfort, you are secure in Jesus. You are secure in Christ. These things going on outside has nothing to do with your condition. You're saved. But what, as we as God's people should do is bless, curse not. Right? That is to be our overall objective and behavior. Now, in verse 2, where he says, Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. This is an if-then statement. Now, in computer programming and in uh, kind of like scripts and writing and programs, you always have an if-then-else. If they click this, do this. Else, do this. In the word of God, we have many if-then. And here is the if. If God has ordained, in verse 2, if God has ordained the ruling authorities, then resisting against the ruling authorities is resisting God. Right? If God has ordained, in the, at the end of verse 1, if there's any authorities... It's because God has ordained there to be an authority and there's, because there's only one authority. Any authority comes under his authority. And he says, verse 2, Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, the authority, resisteth the ordinance of God, the design of God. And they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. Now, rebellion against government is rebellion against God. Now, we see this in verse, in actually Acts, if you've been with us, how, remember when the high priest Ananias had Paul stricken across the mouth, and, he, and the high priest did that unlawfully. And then Paul, not knowing it was the high priest, he reviled the high priest. And then they said, did you know that you're reviling against the high priest, which was also unlawful? And Paul repented. And he says... I did not know it was the high priest. For thou shalt not you know, bring up an accusation against God's high priest. Paul repented of the law which he broke, even though it was Ananias that broke the law to do that. So just because the, the bad behavior of government doesn't mean that it condones bad behavior from us. So that was Paul's attitude. Now, this word damnation at the end of verse 2, it's crema, which means judgment. Now, if we keep this in context, it is very possible and it's likely that what is being said here is the judgment that you will receive the judgment from the authority which God has ordained. It could mean eschatological judgment from God. It could mean God's wrath. But in context, uh, look at verse 3. He's, I believe he's talking about the rulers of the authorities which God has ordained. Verse 3, it says, For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. Um, and he says in verse 4, For he is the minister of God. That minister means servant. Many times we want to lump in minister, meaning, you know, spiritual minister. But it's, he's not talking about a spiritual minister or a preacher. He's talking about a servant, God's servant. For he is the servant of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon them, him that doeth evil. So that's, that's why I believe that damnation in verse 2 is talking about the punishment that the government or the authority would give out as a consequence of being evil. It's not talking about, I believe, God's uh, judgment and wrath here, but he's talking about the ruler's wrath. Now, we're, we're not to separate it either. God will still judge us for obedience unto to his word. But the immediate consequence would be them executing wrath. Now, uh, a couple things. The Bible does not condemn capital punishment. The Bible does not condemn 
capital punishment. It assumes capital punishment in the system of the government. Uh, Paul says in Acts 25, 11, he says, For if I be an offender or have a committed anything worthy of death, I refuse not to die. Paul was saying that as he was bound and he was, going, he was on trial. If I've done anything punishable unto death, then I, I, I accept that judgment. I accept that, that capital punishment. The Bible assumes the... It, it is not teaching to have capital punishment here, and it's not, it's not doing anything. It's neutral. If the government has capital punishment, and that's what it is in verse 4, this, he will bring the sword of execution. He will uh, be a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. So it's not commanding government to have capital punishment, nor is it condemning government to have capital punishment. It just assumes it is here. Um, in verse 5, Wherefore ye must needs be subject, not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. So there's some things that we need to be subject for. Think and keep in mind why we are subject to the government. Why we are subject to those things. Now, as a general rule, governments reward the good and punish the evil. Now this wrath here in verse 5, not only for wrath's uh, sake, it is similar to verse 1's command in here, and then verse 2, he therefore, therefore resisted the power, that word damnation, it is the similar word in verse 5, wherefore ye must needs be subject not only for the wrath that he just talked about, but also for conscious sake. Now, of course, here's our disclaimer. Unless there is some biblical principle being forfeited, we are to obey the law of the land which God has put us in. Unless there's a biblical principle. Now, we see over and over uh, the apostles say we ought to obey God more than man. Remember, the, the government, the political government in their days wanted them they, they commanded them to stop preaching in the name of Jesus Christ. Well, you are violating God's will. And I will obey God's will more than man's will. So that's why I believe here in chapter 13 we get a general sense. This is how we generally are to obey. Um, we should do things in verse 5 not only for the, the repercussions of the government, but also for our conscious sake. The child of God should do things that keep our conscience clear, not just to avoid wrath. Now here's a statement. I like this statement. Believers should submit to the government because they recognize in their conscience that God has ordained the state to rule and because it is his servant on earth. So for conscious sake, not, not just for the consequence we obey the law and submit to the authority which God ordained, but in our conscience we know that God has done it. We're submitting to God, giving government authority in this, the place of authority. Now remember what I said earlier. It is not, we are not condoning evil governments. Good morning. We are not condoning evil people within government uh, by obeying them. We know that there's corruption. But here's the thing, and that's the thing, the, 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 the thing with Christianity is we're not anti-government. We're not anti-authority. But we are pro-God. We recognize and submit to God's authority and whatever God has given authority to. Now, when that authority on earth goes against the will of God, goes against the teachings, it's, it's, it's asking you or it's, it is demanding you to choose to do good or evil, then we choose God. Then we break man's laws to keep God's. So it, that is what we do with our conscience. We submit to what God has given authority on earth. Now, verse 6, for 
For this cause, pay ye tribute also. What that means is taxes. For they are God's ministers attending continually upon this very thing. So also, being an honest Christian and an honest citizen, pay what is due. And that's what he goes on to say, is with conscience clear. Now, for this cause, if you notice in verse 6, it's tying in the previous verses. For this cause pay ye tribute also. Also. For they are God's ministers. Because we have a clear conscience. And because of what he's getting ready to say. We pay our taxes for the clear conscience. And. Two in verse six. They are God's ministers. Attending continually upon this very thing. Uh, and we see a few instances of Jesus paying unto Caesars what is Caesars. He teaches the apostles to do that. He also pays tribute or taxes when he doesn't have to pay taxes. And what he tell Peter, lest, we, lest they should be offended. So when he was in, and actually that's in Matthew chapter 17, when he was in Capernaum, uh, he still had Peter go out and pay tribute lest they should offend them and give them the money. In verse 7, he says, Render therefore to all their dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Now, this verse, the proper relationship to government, does not just mean to just pay your taxes, but that is specifically implied here. But it also means our, we have a responsibility to fear and to honor the authorities which God has ordained. Now that word fear is phobos. And what that means, it's a reverence. The same word fear here is actually used in the, the husband-wife relationship. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 33, it says... Uh, wives to reverence their husbands. Husbands are to love their wives, and the wives are to reverence their husbands. How are they to reverence their husbands? With the same type of submission to the authorities which God has ordained. We respect that God has a design of authority on earth, and that authority answers to God. It's not just authority that can run amok. All of it's answerable to God. But as God's people, we, and that's what it says here, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. And so we are to have reverence, respect for the system of authorities which God has established upon the earth. Now, I like this. This is Shriner's thoughts on this. And this is a general exhortation. He says, this text is misunderstood if it is taken out of context and used as an absolute word so that Christians uncritically comply with the state no matter what is being demanded. What we have here is a general exhortation that delineates what is usually the case. People should normally obey ruling authorities. The text is not intended as a full-blown treatise on the relationship of believers to the state. It is a general exhortation setting forth the typical, the typical obligations one has to civil authorities. The intention in Romans is to sketch in the normal and usual relationship between believers and the ruling power. And that's what I was wanting to, us to get the sense in verses 1 through 7. This is the general exhortation in a normal reigning power upon earth that God has ordained. It, it, it is not violating uh, the faith. It's not violating the will of God that we are to be any society's best civilians. We are not to go out and cause disruption on purpose. We're not to be uh, those who are troublemakers. 
for who God has ordained upon earth. Now think about God has ordained other authorities. Then think about the parent to the child. When a child is submissive to their parent, they're submissive to God. Because God has ordained that authority. And the same thing we saw with husbands and wives. Uh, when a wife is submissive, unless the husband is going against, in, unless the husband is sinning, unless the, the husband is going, uh, has departed from the faith, we see all of these conditions in here. Um, you know, it's the choice, really, of the wife. She can stay and then uh, sanctify the husband through the obedience of the wife, or she can leave. But it's, at that point, she does not need to submit to an authority that is causing her to sin, asking her to sin, demanding her to sin. And the same thing with government. All right, so uh, one last thing about that. Christians should submit to such authority and carry out its statutes unless the state commands believers to do that which is contrary to the will of God. And I hope that that... This lesson, then, we're going to move on to the other Christian obligation. Now, we have a Christian responsibility to the state, to the government, to our uh, civilization. But now he's going to move on to our Christian obligation to love. Um, but I hope that everybody is, is okay on... Um, and we'll, we will definitely hit that again. Again, it's all throughout the Word of God how we are to conduct and behave ourselves with government. All right, so verse 11 says... Um, sorry, verse 8. Kind of skipped ahead there, didn't I? Owe no man anything but to love one another, for he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. Now it's interesting, verse 8, that word owe. What was he just talking about? It kind of goes on into the, in verse 7, he was talking about owing taxes, right? To owe what is due you. To pay your taxes. And Verse 8, then he goes on to say, Owe no man anything. Do not be in debt for anything, but to love one another. Now this is our Christian debt is to be love. This is a debt that will never be paid. We will always be in debt. We will always owe. Now we shouldn't always owe to the government. We shouldn't always owe, I mean, we shouldn't just... You know, uh, borrow and not pay back is the principle before. But now, we do owe. We will never be satisfied and paid in full with the love which we give to each other. It'll never be enough. You know, I've loved, I've loved him enough. But it, nope, you still owe. <laughs> the, so basically, that's what it's saying in verse 8. Owe no man anything but to love one another... For he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. Now, um, in content, this is actually going back to chapter 12, verse 9 through uh, 21, where love is the predominant theme. Remember, have love one to another, let love be without dissimulation. And so he was talking about the exhortation of love one another in the church and love those who are outside the church. And he's coming back to it in verse 8. And with this idea of owing a debt. But he says, uh, what's interesting about this verse is the Greek. Um, one of the, my favorite words is another. Because there's two flavors of the word another in the Greek. There is another of a different kind, and there is another of the same kind. And it'll really help when you can, if, if you're doing a word study or you're, you're studying the Word of God, you know, go on Google and look up the Greek uh, for some of these things, what those words actually mean. There's the strong accord, uh, concordance. It'll tell you the definition of that Greek word. But this one he says, but to love one another, what that means that another is another of the same kind. So is he talking about loving just the people of God, or is he talking about loving lost people as well? He's talking about both. Because that first another is the Greek word hetero, um, alos. And alos, uh, 
means another of the same kind. It is those who have the same nature, the same form, the same class, the same kind. They're not different. So owe no man anything but to love each other of the same kind, for he that loveth another. Now guess which word that is. That's heteros. That's the different word. For he that loveth another of a different kind hath fulfilled the law. Now we know that the law of Christ, right? We know that we are to keep the law of Christ. The law of Christ is to love. And we have seen this many times, that love fulfills the law. Now, Christ has fulfilled the law for righteousness' sake to those who believe, right? So I am no longer under the condemnation of the law because Christ has fulfilled all the law. But Jesus says, I give you a new command. You know, John said, I give you a new command. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, and mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. And he goes on and he explains how love fulfills the law here in verse 9. For this thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Why? Because love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. So our command is to to love. Now, Christ commands us to love. Jesus commands us all to love. And if you do not obey Christ, what did Jesus say? If you don't obey me, you don't love me. Christ commands me to love. And because I love Christ, I obey. And I love. And that's what we have here is it's fulfilling the law. Now, if you truly love, now this is, again, this is talking about both. Those who are in the congregation and those who are out. And when he's talking about your neighbor, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. That could be, you know, if you love your neighbor, you are not going to covet his wife. You're not going to think ill will towards your neighbor. You're not going to steal from him. You're you're not going to kill him. So how does love fulfill the law? Well, it's it's not a series of things not to do. You're giving one thing to do. And that one thing to do is love, and therefore, as a consequence, you're fulfilling the things to not do. And that is verse 10. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. And we can go to 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and and look at that chapter. And verse 11, so that is the Christian's duty to man, so love, to not sin against them, but fulfill the law. Verse 11 through 14, and that knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness, and let us put on the armor of light. Now here's the breakdown. In verse 11, it starts this breakdown. Carry out everything that he has discussed, starting in chapter 12, verse 1, all the way to chapter 13, verse 10. All, starting at chapter 12, remember this is when our practical life starts. Chapter 12, verse 1 says, be devoted to God. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Do not be conformed to this world. Present your bodies a living sacrifice, ready to be used, ready to work for the Lord. That's your personal devotion to God. Then he talks about as a Christian that we are to have humility in the church, We are to love one another. We are to understand what church is. How we are a functioning member within the Lord's New Testament baptized body of believers. How he has tempered us here. He's brought us here to function as a body part would function. Uh, Not to be a a, a dead toe, (laughs) but to actually function. Then he goes on as our walk is to love one another, love your enemy, and obey governments. 
Obey the authorities which God has ordained because there is only one authority, and that's of God. I'm submissive to God, and for my conscience' sake, I understand that, and I reverence what God has put in as an authority in my life. And the practical benefits of doing that is that the government, for the most part, is not an evil to people who do good. They're an evil to people who do bad. That's the general principle. And think about this. Again, we're not anti-government, but God has put government in the place, kingdoms in the place. It's a lot better than anarchy. I mean, I don't know about you, but I wouldn't want to live in the wild, wild west. Laws, government, law enforcement is a whole lot, even though there are times it's corrupt and we're not condoning any of the evil, but it's better than anarchy. Um, So God has ordained that things be in order. God's a God of order. So, carry out all those things because, in verse 11, here's the conclusion, because the end is coming. He says in verse 11, knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, For now is our salvation nearer than when we believe. That means our physical salvation when the Lord shall return. Verse 12, the night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. I love the way Peter just puts in this poet, or I mean Paul puts in this poetry. And it it is. He has so many metaphors. I don't know if y'all like metaphors. I love metaphors. But Who you used to be was in darkness, and you had works according to that darkness. But now, just as if you had just woken up, you woke up this morning, what did you do in the darkness last night? You slept, unless you have third shift, you slept. Now is the time that you have awoken out of that darkness, you are a child of God, you are a child of light, you put off those things that, you put off those bed clothes, you put off the things that, when you were asleep, and now you put on the child of light. It's a day. God has made a day. We work while it is day. That's what Jesus said. We work while we have light. Verse 12, that night is far spent. It's in the past. Leave it in the past. Don't live for what's in the past. But the day is now. It's at hand. Let us therefore cast off those works of darkness. Let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering. Now, chambering means uh, defilement of the bed as far as adultery or fornication. There's chamber, that's what chambering means. There's no defilement of the bed. And wantonness is an unbridled lust. You just can't get your, you can't reel it in. It's, It's controlling you, you not it. Not in strife and envying. Verse 14 but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. And so this chapter, we have seen the Christian duty, the Christian responsibilities as a Christian citizen. What debt should the Christian owe? The Christian should owe a debt of love and the Christian incentive We do all these things from chapter 12 all the way to this point because we see the day approaching. Because there will be time to sleep. There will be a time when the work is done. But also, as we work, we don't put on the night clothes when we were in darkness. We put on the day clothes because we're children of light. And that's what we are to do. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the day. Lord, we pray and we ask, Lord, that you'll just bless this day of worship, of coming together, loving each other, edifying one another in the Lord. Father, singing in psalms and hymns of praise. and Father, we pray that you'll just have your, your perfect work in the hearts of all people here this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.